Hey friends, and welcome to another episode of the Incredible Halt Podcast. On today's episode, Byron Reese stops by. He is an absolute expert in the space of AI and author and just wrote one of my favorite books of the year, Stories, Dice, and Rocks That Think. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Byron Reese. And as I said, my guest today, Mr. Byron Reese, my friend, how are you today? I am doing very well and even better for being here. Uh, it is an honor to have a couple minutes to talk to you. The new book is coming out here in August. It's Stories, Dice, and Rocks That Think, subtitled How Humans Learn to See the Future and Shape It. And we will talk about that, but I sort of want to go back one book to ask a question. And you know, before we started recording, um, you were talking about you're writing the next book, which we can or cannot get into. But I reread The Fourth Age while I was reading Stories, Dice, and Rocks That Think to kind of put those two together. And I'm, I'm wondering, before we kind of get in what the book's about, is it, and I don't get the sense that you do a lot unintentionally. So is it, are these three intentionally like a trilogy or do these just sort of feel like a trilogy? Well, um, thank you. Um, they, they certainly, in my mind, they are a progression. That is very true. Uh, the Fourth Age is a philosophy book about artificial intelligence. And it just, I'm not supposed to say that because that means nobody wants to buy a philosophy book, but that's what it is. It tries to figure out, you know, can machines, whatever. And then that leads to this book, which I got really interested in the question about what makes people different than animals. Because on the one hand, people say, well, we're just another animal. But on the other hand, on the other hand, we sure have a different outcome than, say, beavers or something, right, in terms of <laughs> yes. this look around. Uh, this next book is about the superorganism Agora that I talk about briefly in, in this book. So it flows from that. And I don't know what I'll write, if anything, after that. So let's let's talk about the book that is in the process of, of coming out. Because one of the things, Byron, that I love about your writing style is it's it's really, really heady in the fact that like, I think a lot when I read your pieces and sandwiched in there somewhere is a lot of observations that we take for granted every day that are actually really important to understanding how the world works, right? And I was thinking about you the other day because, and we'll get into some of the clickbaity, like AI is going to take over the world and we're gonna, right? We'll get into that here in a little bit. But I thought about you the other day because I was prepping for this interview and it was 107 degrees here in, in Grand Rapids where I am. And I was texting to a friend of mine who was asking how, how hot did it get today? And I texted the word degree and my phone decided to send a diploma to this person as an emoji. I'm like, we, we will be fine, friends. We will be, it has no idea what I'm actually right. talking about. But I wanna start with stories, Dyson rocks that think it's uh, in three parts. And I have to tell you, Byron, the first part it took me about a week before I could move on from the axe story because like this whole idea that there is homo erectus that is just creating a tool that isn't actually a tool. It's just something in their DNA that they pick two things up and stick them together. It took me a minute to like get past that. And I know some of the, the nexus for this book started with the Warner Herzog documentary. Maybe kind of step me through. You watch this documentary which is incredible caves of the forgotten dreams and then what happens after that you you sit down and you go huh all right i wrote this fourth age i'm super interested in like obviously ai technology and humanity where does this start you know it's funny you mentioned the thing about erectus because um i have like the world's best editor and i told <laughs> her about that when i was writing and i said and then about a month later I mentioned it again, and she said, you know, not a day has gone by that I have not thought about that. And let me just tell that quick story. Yeah, and then please I'll do, yeah. Very directly. Um, there, there was a creature named, uh, we call Homo erectus, uh, that lived for a million and a half years, a long time, very successful. And uh, it roamed over three continents, and it had uh, one tool called an Acheulean hand axe. And an Acheulean hand axe looks like a big arrowhead in the shape of a teardrop. And we find them scattered all over Asia, Africa, and Europe. And the thing about them is over 
And there are so many of them that you can buy one on eBay, a tool used a million years ago for a hundred bucks. There's that many of them. But the interesting thing is you, you can't tell them apart when they were made. I could show you two that were made on different continents a million years apart and say, which is older? And you'd have a hard time. Even the experts only date them to plus or minus 500,000 years. And that, that's really anomalous because if every erectus had just tried to copy their parents' hand axes, they would drift, especially once yeah. they got into different climates and all that. But they never did. And so the conclusion was not mine. Uh, I quote some research papers in it. But the conclusion is that they did. it was not a cultural object. It was not a piece of technology, unless you think a bird's nest is a piece of technology. Birds everywhere will build the same nest year after year. Like they know how to build that nest. But, you know, the the, the butter, the, the caterpillar doesn't wrap itself in silk thinking, I'm going to be a butterfly. Like it doesn't know. It does right. what it is programmed to do and evidently that's what erectus was and that's really mind-blowing to me that for eighty thousand generations no erectus looked at that thing and said you know it would be better if blank and yet it took us three generations to get from kitty hawk to the moon and so we're a very different thing and that was the question that um i wrote that this book to answer and immediately that took me to uh, the cave at chauvet which What's not what's amazing about the caves and the cave art uh, is not just that it's beautiful, which it is like it, it's not just like, well, that's beautiful because it's old. Right. It's like it's really nice, beautiful, serene. And the mind blowing thing is that's her oldest cave art. It's not like the old cave art had stick figures and then they got like triangles for dresses. And then eventually they became saying, no, no, we started out like that. And we started out like that. And we find musical instruments that for the first time there and, um, and representations of other things like uh, not just geometric art, but like carved females or a statuette with a lion's head all at the same time. And that, that's kind of just, what was going on in my head, that whole thing about erectus, didn't know what it was doing and didn't really have no technology. And then all of a sudden, somehow we come along and like that can paint that stuff out of nowhere. And then we're a very different thing. And why did that happen? And I mean, I think it happened because a radioactive spider bit somebody <laughs> at some point in the past. I mean, it's something like that, like what? not literally that, but some tweak in probably one person just, when you think about how similar our genetics are to say a chimpanzee, so similar. And yet you see how just tiny little tweaks make separate us from chimps. Some little tweak happened to us. And all of a sudden we acquired all these superpowers. And one of them, I believe was the capacity for um, speech, but it wasn't speech like speech out loud. I mean, that's nice. And all of that it's inner speech. It's uh, the language of thought. I don't think we thought before that happened. And uh, that sounds like pure speculation, but I don't know if you remember the Helen Keller quote I put in there. Yes, absolutely. About, yeah. She talks about what her life was like before her teacher came. And she said she didn't even know she was a thing different from the universe. And she didn't know there was her and it. And then she said only after she learned that kind of stuff did she become conscious. This is her own writing. And, uh, and I find that fascinating. So what happened is we got this capacity, I think we got this capacity for language, which we used for thought. And that um, somehow that enabled us to believe in two things that don't actually exist. The future, and the not real things, but we understand what they are and animals don't. I, I'm sure I'm going to get some pushback on that. And I've spent a lot of time in the book saying, well, maybe this one particular bird can think two hours ahead. And, but there's no animal that's going to invest in a 401k. I mean, they're not, and they don't have episodic memory. They don't remember specific things in the past. And that's sort of, you start, that started taking shape in my head as, okay, we got all these capacities. We suddenly could think, and we could, we, we, we suddenly could tell ourselves stories. And those aren't Jack and the Beanstalk stories. Those are like, okay. Okay, I don't want to get those berries up at the top of that hill, but I know the cave up there too. And if I go up there and I make too much noise, the lions like telling yourself stories about the future. And that's what we do. 
and we inform them by things about the past. And believe it or not, I think that's kind of it, is that the reason beavers build the same dam generation after generation, the reason Erectus built the same thing is they don't have any mechanism for their knowledge to accumulate over time. Whereas we do. I mean, I'm born into, you know, if you, if you drop, last thing I'll say on this part, if you drop me on a desert Island, uh, I, I, I fared decently well. I'd seen a bunch of Mythbusters and I've seen <laughs> Culligan's Island yep. and yeah, yeah. I could do, but if a real Tarzan, a real baby that had no cultural history, you drop them on the island, they're just an animal. But but we're born into this like long thing and this accumulated knowledge in the past. So that was how I started writing it. And I did not know where it was going to go. Because, but, but eventually what happened is I said, okay, okay, all right. We we got this capacity to think about the future and and that was good. But then we wanted to predict the future. We wanted to know what was going to happen. And that leads into the second section of the book. So I want to stay in the first section for just a half second. I understand. I, you know, no, no, no. <laughs> just because like I came to the idea that the three books were going to be connected because of the first section. Cause I was walking, I was on a work shoot and I was telling a friend about this book. I'm like, I'm reading this crazy book and there's this homo erectus and they've got this tool, but it's not really a tool cause you're just born to do it. And then out of nowhere, there's a person who can who can think. And then probability shows up and then AI shows up. And I said, as I'm saying this sentence out loud, one, I don't know why anyone wouldn't want to read that book because I'm immediately like lit up by that whole idea that like for a million and a half years, there's this yeah. one thing that doesn't really evolve and just kind of exists. Like, and then all of a sudden somebody puts strawberry and ice cream, right? And then we were off to the races and making like all these crazy flavors. But I came to this like aha moment where I thought, okay, the the person who who has thought in their head for the first time and can know that the tiger is up there is now sort of messing around with probability, but doesn't really know what nope. that is, right? Um, and that idea of that you have a, a notion of probability, but not a word to describe it, gives you the ability to have fire and language at the same time, or agriculture and the wheel of the right, like those those things that happen in the fourth age that kind of set up AI start to make a, a lot more sense when you know what came before us didn't really move for a million and a half years, and then all of a sudden, like you said, we get Peter Parker, and then and then here we go. And so as we move into the second part of the book, you know, we, we get to an important year in 1654, I believe is the important year where we kind of define probability, right? And, and before we talk about the book, that is actually the question I want to ask. You know, I, I said beforehand, I want to ask about you real quickly, because I was uh, listening to an interview with you and, and offhandedly, the interviewer asked you, how did you how did you get into this space? What got you into AI and technology and, and where you are today? And you talked about the first time you came in contact with a hyperlink. But as an aside, you said your first computer was a VIC-20, right? And I, and I wonder if, if you're able to go back We'll, we'll use the book as a formula, right? <laughs> Your ability to go back in the past and maybe put some words around, like you get that VIC-20 and what happens to you? Like, you know, you're coding on it, but prior to having the computer, you didn't really know what coding was. And now you're, right, now you're coding. What happens to young Byron when he's got this VIC-20 and then the trajectory? I think, I, you know, to, to start with what you were talking about, walking with your friend and talking about the book. I actually think I am my average reader. Like that's what I think I am. I think I write my books for people just like me. And uh, I, I think they could all write these books too. I'm just picking my little thing I'm interested in and learning, working real hard on it and researching it all and, and trying to spread my excitement on this stuff. Because if you want the common thread, the common thread are things I'm really interested in like this. And that's really what, and and that's why one thing kind of leads to the other. I think the biggest thing the VIC-20 did to me, especially once I got the 3K expansion pack to right. plug into the back of it and had that yep. extra 3,000 bytes, um, was that it allowed me to, I could understand that machine. I mean, like, I don't know, I couldn't take it apart and all that, but I understand what it does and how it does it. 
And I learned to program in basic and I had a data set, which is a tape recorder that could store programs. And, and the cool thing about it is as long as I stayed up on that, because then I got a Commodore 64 and I was like, okay, I get it. And it's one notch further. And then eventually I got a 286 and and one or the other. And, and the great thing is that if you're able to come up with it like that, you never have that moment where it feels completely alien to you. Like if I were born today and you gave me an iPad, I mean, it's like a miracle book window that shows me, yep. but that's what I think it really did is if you get in like right at the beginning on something like that, you can kind of stay with it as it goes up and you have a real intuitive sense of how it works and, and, and that, uh, I think, is uh, probably what that, uh, the, uh, the effect of that. Because, in, you know, you and I are, are similar age. And I was thinking when I was listening to that interview, like the first time uh, my buddy and I, he had a Texas Instruments and he had one of those dungeon crawlers that was text based. Mm -hmm. Right. And for me, it was this aha moment that a story like words can have movement, right? Because there's no pictures. It was just like, there is an orc and he wants to eat you, right? What did you, what do you do? Hit, you know, hit space bar. Um, but I walked away with that going like, very similar to what you said, like you start building those blocks of like, well, what can, what can a story do? How far can a story go? If, you know, my copy of the Hobbit is now, you know, on this computer and I'm in, now I'm Bilbo Baggins, as opposed to reading about Bilbo mm -hmm. Baggins. And that leads to the, you know, not only probability, but the second part of this book that the importance of stories to move this culture forward and clearly something that Homo erectus didn't have because they didn't move. Right? right. For a million right. and a half years, they didn't evolve at all because they had no way, which I think the reason, Byron, I had such a hard, not a hard time. I enjoyed it greatly, but I sat on that for the, for a week is going. And this is the stuff that I love about your books. It's like, I had a hard time figuring out what it would be like to be close to what I am today, but unable to think in my head or speak out loud. Like, what would that life be like for a million and a half years? Where there might be people around you, but you can't talk to them and nothing happens in your head and just life happens to you very much like the beaver example you have early on in the book. But talk to me about the importance of stories and how that drives this culture forward. And then we'll get into probability. So, you know, we learn to tell stories as an internal construct and uh, they, they were ways for us to imagine different futures and picture how likely they were and all of that. But then at some point we started telling them. And then I put 20, 21, were there 21 purposes of stories? And I, I mean, I tried to, I, I just immersed myself in it because you start by getting all the books that document every kind of fairy tale there is. And there's like these thousands of them. And they, anyway, and, and, and so, I mean, I read every piece of literature I could find about stories. And what I found is that they, uh, spoken stories, campfire stories, um, is they're a, a human universal, you know, they're, they, they're one of those things that every culture we find, no matter how uncontacted, they have that. And, um, and that we use them for all these different purposes. They are two ways to reinforce social norms and to uh, be aspirational and make sense of the past and why we're here. And uh, so, I, I mean, I try to go through uh, a list of those because they become kind of our Words are great. I mean, language, spoken language is kludgy because uh, I think I point out in there, we don't actually have organs for it, right? Your, your tongue you, is mainly, you had that for eating and your lungs you have for breathing and you, you mess all this stuff together and you, you have spoken language and then it is wonderful. Don't get, I'm not, but it has a, it has a limit to it. And the, but stories are ways to kind of connect on um, something very meta beyond the actual words and to, to connect on those things. So unfortunately I came out of section one, um, a book is about 80,000 words. I came out of section one with 50,000 words and my editor was like, you know, no, I, you know, so, I mean, I had to, I cut out so what is it? I cut out 20,000 words. I had written about uh, the Greek religions, you know, with the gods, Zeus and all of that, yep. and whether they actually believe them or not. I talked about the Hayes Code um, and, and our control, our attempt to control um, 
what was in movies early on in motion picture history, all of that. Like, and then, you know, like every word is a drop of my blood. And <laughs> out. Yes, but yeah, it, it's a cleaner, it's a cleaner book for it. So. And, you know, and like I said, when you read this book, you will think about your world differently. I mean, I, you know, I'm walking through my house today after, you know, reading stories, dice and rocks that think, and the fourth age kind of back to back, just thinking, looking at the house differently than I did maybe huh. three weeks ago. Right. Cause now you're, now you're cognizant of the things that you're interacting with. And then when you come in contact as, and we'll talk about this in a second, but as you and I are speaking today, there were, I think five crazy AI stories just today alone. Right. And, and I think when you think, when you come in contact with your words and the way in which you lay out this case, and then look at the way in which you interact with the world, I mean, you have a, a, a profound quote, there's a lot of them, but there's one of them that stood out to me among the, the rest. And that's this idea that we built a world without an undo button. And that's been rolling around in my head ever since I read the book and walking around my house going like, yep, I could not do this without all of these things that do these things that I just take for granted, right? That my clock is on time and the alarm clock goes off and my Alexa tells me when something shows up and the temperature stays constant when it's 107 degrees and my refrigerator run like all of those things that we just don't pay attention to. And so as we're in section two, we're leaving section one. Um, and this actually happens later in the book, but I feel like character wise, it happens earlier in the book. You talk a lot about not a versus, but it, it might feel like a versus. So feel free to, to catch me on this, but this, this idea that science versus magic and um, I wonder if I could get your sense on if science can be magical, because it feels to me like when someone gets bit by this radioactive spider, there's a wonder in there of why, why this one person, why this moment in history, why not the other million and a half years prior to this, that obviously has scientific backing. And you, I mean, the amount of research that you have to do for this book seems improbable, right? Like there's so much in here in, you know, less than 300 pages that I already want to go start again, because I want to dive back in because I've got a lot of questions, but, you know, but I, but I wonder if I'm off base on that, if that science can be wonder and magical, not magic like wizards, but magical in the way that something happens and we might not have a hard and fast way to explain the why of it. Absolutely. I mean, I, um, come from the Arthur C. Clarke uh, school of any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Sure. And, uh, and you know, he was no mystic. No, <laughs> not at really. all. Yeah. Um, and, but I think, uh, I think like being okay with it feeling like magic, like is, uh, I think, I don't know, still a, a, a way to like engage that wonderment. I, I would actually like to give you a real example, which is yeah, um, please do. I, we didn't even set this up, and I have something for show and tell in front of me, and, and you don't even know about this, <laughs> which is uh, section two is about probability, and that sounds so boring, but it doesn't have an equation in it, and it's got some fun history about how we didn't used to know that. <laughs> the older you got, the more likely you were to die that year. And all these things we just didn't know that we kind of should have, like you could spend a Sunday afternoon with a piece of paper in a cemetery and you could write down the ages that people died at. You could build mortality tables out of that. But regardless, um, the idea of probability that there's an 80% chance something's going to happen is uh, we're born into it. We don't even think anything of it, but that was the 1654 thing, kind of what, what happened is uh, there were five things that we didn't understand about the world. And I'm only going to talk about one of them that we had to kind of figure out before we could understand that something like probability exists. And I have to say, if you had asked me, um, if you were to ask me, and I didn't know the answer to this. If you flip a coin a thousand times, how many times will it come up heads? And I didn't already know. It's like always going to come up heads about 500 times to partake. I would say, I don't know, like 100, 500, 900. I, 
No way to know. I'm sure it's all over the map. In reality, reality, the chances that it's less than 400 or more than 600 or one in 4 billion, like it's never going to happen. So how can these coin tosses come up always between 400 and 600? And that is uh, this thing, which is a what's known as a Galton board. You've probably seen these in the science museum. When I flip it, these little BBs are going to start falling and they can fall with equal likelihood to the left or the right. Um, if they keep falling to the left or the right, they end up in the corner. If they kind of go back and forth, they end up in the middle. And what happens is you can do this all day long and you'll notice that you have a normal curve in there. Yep. And then you can flip it again and then you flip it back up again and and you have a normal curve. I was tilting it a little bit. Sure. And that is magic. <laughs> I don't know how other way to think about it. Yeah, and which again kind of keeps us in these two places cuz you know the you were right about the probability part. It is fascinating to think about because again it's another thing that I think we just take for granted that we use probability probably thousands of times a day without thinking probably. about it, right? Pro pro sorry, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> or maybe I did. I don't know. But that's all the more reason why I find the beginning of the book so insanely wondrous is like, why doesn't the probability Galton board stuff exist with Homo erectus, right? Like, what is that moment where prob like mathematical probability is the key to human, you know, and I know that's not necessarily what you're postulating, but like, when you show me that, that is actual magic. And one of the competitive differences between us and a beaver is they don't have a Galton board, right? They they don't have probabilities. They just wake up and make a dam and then eat lunch, right? Like, so I, I just, I cannot stress enough, like those first two parts of the book are just wondrous. And the way in which you lay out this story, you know, and I, I know you you quote Sapiens early on, but I thought very similarly, the the joy I felt reading Sapiens, I felt reading this as well. Oh, like this is, thank you. this is just, it's, uh, it's such a profoundly great book. And, you know, I know we've, we don't have a ton of time left and I want to make sure we get into the thing that you are absolutely one of my favorite humans to follow on, which is how the book ends, you know, the, the rocks that think and, and how we're going to work with AI and the argument between, you know, this narrow AI and this, your, you know, your words, not mine, this nearly mystical <laughs> general AI. Um, and my question to lead into to part three of this book is why do we get it wrong so much? You were one of the few people and I know in your book, you talked about you interviewed 100 people on your podcast and only three people kind of side with your point of view. Why is it so easy to just go Skynet? That's the only probable answer that we're going to get to is Terminators are coming and that's the end of all of this. Well, to put flesh on what you're referencing um, for the benefit of the listeners, I used to host a podcast called Voices in AI and I had a hundred, I had 120 guests on it, but about a hundred of them asked um, if they thought we were going to make general intelligence and only three said no. I mean, I remember the three and everybody else said yes. And then when you ask people like, when are we going to get it? You get guesses all over the map, five to 500 years. Some of those five-year guesses were made over five years ago, but I shall not uh, dwell on that. And I, um, I want to I pause you just real quick. So for the listener, I can explain the difference. So general AI is oh, essentially, you. Yes. you know, is essentially the Skynet that you've seen in Terminator movies, right? And a sentient being that is going to overlord over humanity and tell us what to do and do whatever it feels like doing because it's tired of making you toast in the morning where, you know, the AI that we are used to is more along the lines of what we know how to do and these individual things just do one thing very well please correct me if i'm getting this incorrect in any way no, no. but like you know your phone gps takes you in a direction but it doesn't make you a hamburger right it can't do two it can't bifurcate in any way shape or form that might be the the simplest way to explain it to me anyway absolutely absolutely general ai is c3po it's commander data sure. yes it's uh, the robots and it's it's uh, uh, ex machina yep it's her that's a general AI. There, there's sort of a like a gut belief that narrow AI is just kind of a primitive version of it, and there are people who think that, but that is that is a minority view. Most people think general AI is something very different, a different technology. It's the way we do narrow AI 
it's not the past. We look for patterns and we try to make projections into the future. And so it only works where the past looks like the future, like a spam email yesterday probably looks a lot like spam email tomorrow. And, but that's probably not enough to get us to general AI. Um, so when you would, when I would ask these 96 people, well, how 97 people, how are you so confident we're going to build it, but you have no idea when, like, why are you so confident? Cause we don't know how to build it. And, uh, I find all of these folks are very reflective. They're very smart and they thought about it and, and they say, well, we know general intelligence is possible because we're machines with general intelligence. And if hypothetically you could take every neuron in your brain and scan it and model it, then it should say, hi, I'm right. Like, and that's the core assumption that people are machines. People are machines. And when I ask general audiences that question, because I talk on this topic, I get about 15% of people raise your hand when I say, do you think you're a machine? My editor, not the same one I was just talking about, um, wrote in the margin, oh, come on, nobody really thinks they're a machine. <laughs> Isn't that something? And it's like, no, everybody I know says that. And I don't know. Well, I do know why. It's a, it's a, it's a mechanistic way of looking at the, at the world that says, you know, A leads to B leads to C and there's nothing in you other than electricity and chemicals. And I don't actually think you have to go uh, mystical to not believe that. I mean, here would be my logic. My logic uh, put simply is, you know, <clears throat> we have these brains that we don't understand. Like, do you remember, I don't know, the color of your first bicycle? No, I don't actually. Do you remember the name of your fourth grade teacher? Ah, uh, yes, Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith. And I assume you don't think about Mrs. Smith frequently. Never, actually. Okay, right, you see, right. and yet somehow, boom, you went right to it. And there's no Mrs. Smith location in your brain. We don't know how you coded that or how you retrieved it of all the things in there. Like, we don't know any of that. I'm not even convinced it's all in your brain. You know, there's epigenetics and all the other things going on. But regardless, that's fine. So we got to just be okay with, well, our brains, every neuron may be as complicated as a supercomputer. I mean, it may be something that's, who knows? But then there's, you have a mind. A mind is all these things you can do that your a, a organ doesn't seem like it should be able to. Like you have a sense of humor. No part of you has a sense of humor. None of your neurons have a sense of humor. Your heart doesn't have a sense of humor. Your stomach doesn't have a sense of humor. Somehow you do. And that comes from your mind, whatever that is. We don't know what it is, but a general intelligence presumably would have a mind. But then that's not all. You're conscious. You experience the world. And people say we don't know what consciousness is. We know we know exactly what we're talking about. Like a thermometer can measure temperature, but you can feel warmth. No thermometer can feel warmth. And that experience of warmth, that's consciousness. And not only do we not know how we are conscious, we do not know how matter can actually experience the universe. Like we don't know. We don't know. But you might need that actually for general intelligence. So you, we don't understand that rise to these minds. We don't understand that somehow bring about consciousness. We don't understand. And then to have these people say, oh, yeah, we can build that. Absolutely. Uh, I just have not been persuaded of that. Uh, and that is what kind of strikes me as magical thinking, just assuming that somehow if you, you know, I wrote about the cargo cults in the fourth age, like, you know, these people who would build fake runways hoping airplanes would land and yeah. give them cargo it's like you can build that runway all you want you, you can build a computer that has as many neurons look the human brain project in europe is spending billions under the assumption that if they can make a human brain i just i just don't but i think really to me the most interesting part about section three was something i did write about in the fourth age and it, it goes like this um this is to me the biggest idea in the book and it's the topic of the next book and it, it, it starts uh, with um, a reference to an essay written by a guy um, and I'm going to forget his name anyway the essay is called I Pencil Leonard Reed thank you uh, Leonard Reed wrote this essay 70 years ago called I Pencil and he said there's not a person in the world who knows how to build a pencil nobody can mine the ore and then refine it to steel and wrap it in the ferrule and tap the rubber tree, the rubber to make the eraser and make the yellow paint. Nobody knows how to do that. And yet pencils somehow get made. You see, for billions of years, the only place we've had to write knowledge is our DNA. 
I find that fascinating. And the cool thing about it is it, the bad thing is it takes like 10,000 years to write one thing. Right. Yes. Uh, but it's really reliable, you know, low error rate. And then all of a sudden one day we um, got language and we could remember things in our head and that became our DNA. It's not in our cells solely anymore. And then I could say to you, don't eat the purple berries. They're awful. And instead of 10,000 years later, you know that like that's a positive mutation that passes through the human genome in words, not in nucleic acid. And then to fast forward even further, a smartphone, nobody knows how to make a smartphone, right? Like your body has 30 different elements in it. Your smartphone has 60. It's arguably, you know, more complex than you. And somehow all those elements come together and make that thing. And nobody knows how to do it. And you say, well, well, who does? And I think it's this creature. You can think of it as a metaphor. And it's probably the easiest way to think of it. This metaphor, a, a, a creature called Agora. Agora is an old Greek word for the old marketplace in ancient Greece where all the transactions and commerce and like sure. just yeah, imagine yeah. Yep. the energy of, of all of that town square and um agora agora's dna is all the written words everywhere in the world now just like your own dna has a bunch of junk take all the writing in the world a bunch of junk in it but everything you need to know how to, to make a smartphone is in there somewhere and so we're not the ones making the smartphone agora makes agora knows how to make the smartphone we just do our tiny little bit and we all come together and that makes the smartphone. And that, that to me is really, I don't know, uh, something I still haven't wrapped my, that's why I'm writing a whole book on that topic, uh, trying to wrap my head around. But the end, to go back to general intelligence, you know, we don't, I don't really want to, I think everything we kind of want to do with AI, like all the good stuff and the bad stuff, we don't actually need general intelligence. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, we don't have to have any breakthrough. Like if, if there were no more breakthroughs in AI, we have 40 years worth of catching up to do just implementing what we know. Yes. Well, we know. And so there's all these things we can do uh, with it and for good or ill, for good or ill. Byron, so I will leave you with this last question because I'm interested in your, your take on this. So someone picks up the book and they finish it. What, what questions should they be asking themselves when they're done with the book? I mean, there's a fantastic question at the end of it that I do not want to spoil because it actually made the whole book for me. So I really want people to enjoy that last sentence of the book. But for you, you know, what would be a win for you for somebody to read this book and come up to you and say, I read the book and I came up with X? I don't know. I was going to tongue in cheek say, I assume their question's going to be, Am I within my return privilege with Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> Send it back and get their twenty two ninety five back. Yes, I promise I really that will not. Know. I promise I will, that will not be their question. Think about that. I don't know. To me, uh, there is joy in the knowing, and that's what I love. It's just like feeling like you know, the world is a big mystery. Existence is a mystery. You know, the big question of all is like, why is there something and not nothing? And I don't, that's above my pay grade, uh, but there is something. And then it's like, well, why is it the way it is? Like, why is it this way and not another way? And uh, I guess that's really what I want to figure out for myself. And I don't feel like I have, I mean, I shouldn't have like, right. How can, how can the, you know, drop of water contemplate the ocean? It's, it's, but, you know, shame on me if I don't try, like shame on me if I don't like, put a lot of thought into it. Plus it's a lot of fun. And um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I meet a lot of people uh, like you that are very interesting and I learn from them and I don't know, to me, that's what gives me the, ex so I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. A terrible way to leave uh, your interview. Oh, that is, that is quite all right. Um, because I, I will leave it like this. And I will say that my friend, the work that you're doing, as I said, one, when you read your books, you can tell that you get great joy in writing them because there's there's an energy and a, and a humor and like it hits all the notes that you know that this person is super into the thing that they're writing. But what I would say is the work that you're doing and the optimism and joy in which you approach it 
is super important. And I cannot, I cannot recommend this book enough. Stories, Dice, and Rocks to Think, How Humans Learned to See the Future and Shape It by Maurice. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll talk again soon. Thank you.